Okay, so from prior knowledge, okay, Mm, just out of curiosity, who can name a supporting cell? That has nothing to do with this. This is, this is a lot more advanced than what we did last week. But who can give a, an example of a nerve cell from prior two weeks? How about a Schwann cell? What might that do? It has something to do in common with an oligodendrocyte, which is kind of hard to say. They produce something, they produce a fatty substance. But which one is which? One of them is in the peripheral nervous system, the other one is in the central nervous system. I just want to kind of gauge where we're at, see if we can read. And if you don't remember, just say, I don't remember. Okay. Ask and answer. So the Schwann cells are supportive structures in the peripheral nervous system that produce myelin. Do we know what that myelin does by chance? Why is that important? You are correct. Does that make the impulse more efficient? Yes, it does. Okay, so then the oligodendrocytes are found in the central nervous system that also produce myelin. Okay, there are glial cells. Those are what will actually, let's say, clean up different types of debris that you'd find in the central nervous system, possibly. There's also astrocytes. And those will do what with the blood supply? They deliver two key components to your neurons in your brain. And those would probably be what and what? Just guess. Well, muscles, same thing. Have to have this. No guesses? Need carbon dioxide? No, if they don't need carbon dioxide, that's the byproduct, so they need the oxygens one. And what else? Water, which is true, which would also be nutrients. So your astrocytes uh, will, will do that in your nervous system. Then, let's see here. I think that's probably enough for that. Okay. What are two ions that we talked about that produce these wave potentials that move on? That's why you drink Powerade or Gatorade or body armor or whatever that's called. Yeah, they're electrolytes like sodium and potassium. That's right. And let's see here. What else could we talk about? What is the breakdown of your autonomic nervous system? It's on that chart. Okay. You have a PNS and an SNS, sympathetic nervous system and a parasympathetic nervous system. Let's picture maybe uh, what we're talking about first hour with when you get closer towards the end of the season, it's always more exciting, but maybe it gets to be a little more ner you're, you're, you're nervous about the upcoming game or match you might have to um, that you're going to participate in, which is just natural. Um, you may have a problem trying to, let's say, get some Z's, and that's where your melatonin is secreted in your brain and slowly brings your, your, uh, your metabolism back down. That's known as your rest and repair division or your parasympathetic. Then your sympathetic nervous system is what will cause... Uh, a lot of people just refer to the flight or fight response when your heart rate goes up, your respiratory rate goes up. Okay, that's on the autonomic side. You do not have any control over that. But on the somatic side, what type of muscles do you have control over?
we just patted the beat your your heel of your boots on the floor there we're moving our legs moving our leg over there what type of muscle does that skeletal muscle because it's moving your skeleton that's right so your somatic division works with um, that of your um, skeletal system in other words skeletal muscles which you do have conscious control over all right so after talking about that for a little bit are we thinking oh my gosh i forgot a lot of that information already yes no that's where uh, just kind of bring that information back okay now that video these structures here okay it's not that any one more portion of the brain is more important than the other but what is the most important for day-to-day -day vital life functions which one of these is the most important and it's also the oldest part of the brain if you want to look at it that way you are right what does the brain stem do What are your vital functions that you don't have to think about every night or every day? Your heart rate and your breathing or your respiratory rate. So your brain stem takes care of that. Okay. This deals with your emotions because it has your thalamus and hypothalamus gland in there that have an effect on your pituitary gland, which we'll get into next chapter when we talk about hormones and how that interacts with the body then you have this cerebellum and cerebrum okay which one of those two is larger the cerebrum or the cerebellum you are correct why would that be larger because usually we refer to it as two sides two lobes a, a left and a right brain that's when we say if someone is more, let's say, spontaneous as opposed to uh, maybe more uh, of a critical thinker. It doesn't mean that you're not. It just means that's maybe what you could be stereotyped at. Maybe yes, maybe no. Okay. And then finally, this was the last part. This is actually hanging in the back. And this is where a lot of your muscle memory would, would take. It's, it's actually stored back here in your cerebellum. Okay. And one of the one of the aspects in the video they had talked about is free throw shooting or if you have to memorize your routine in that of a, a marching band or cheerleading routine or even just that of serving a volleyball all the information then is stored here in your cerebe cerebellum so then that information is recalled and the, what allows you to perform a functions hopefully without even having to think about it. and you don't that's why we joke about when we're saying some of the responses we get it's kind of like geez that's the spirit it's kind of like you throw the volleyball up and you're about to hit it and you think this is going to be bad and it's when your frontal lobes can shut that response out that's what will help boost your confidence then Okay, and that's why they talk about if they could do an MRI of, of who, like a Tiger Woods or maybe um, if uh, Ted Williams was still alive or even that of Joe DiMaggio who were very great uh, baseball hitters or those types of top athletes. You could even say like LeBron James, like a lot of the uh, information that's stored in that cerebellum would be kind of interesting to see how we could apply it to um, perhaps uh, your, your, your daily lives, whether it's athletics or, or something to that effect. Okay, so that in short is a lot of the functions of what we consider structures of the brain. Okay, where are memories stored then? Are they stored cerebrum, brainstem? Probably not. Probably not here. And I don't think so much in the cerebellum, but the, remember the cerebral cortex is so big that you have uh, optic lobes in the back, you got frontal lobes, you have corpus striata, they're kind of in the middle. 
Okay, and that's where a lot of these memories can be stored, whether it's long or short term. That's why we talked about what was his name, Clyde uh, Waring or Clyde Schwering. I can't remember what his name was. He can't remember what his son does, and they illustrated that in the video. And his wife would even tell him that, and less than ten seconds later, he couldn't repeat that. That's how bad his short-term memory was. But as far as the piano, what was so remarkable about that? He can still remember how to play the piano. And there's really no rhyme or reason on why something like that can happen to people. Um, that's why one of your questions, I guarantee, is going to deal with this, these two structures here, is you can still live when there's trauma to your cerebral cortexes. You may forget things. Things may not taste the same. They may have to deal with your memory. You may get angry more often. Okay? You may have slurred speech. Or, and then the last one, maybe your coordination wouldn't be the same. But those are the four functions of that cerebral cortex. Your memory, okay? your emotions, your coordination, and then how you speak or your language. All that is stored and built upon in your cerebral cortex. And that's always going to change as you get older. Your brain continually rewires itself. That's what we call cerebral plasticity. And that's also why they said, if you're going to learn a language, when's the best time to do that? Probably when you're seven years, well, I don't know if it's seven years old, just when you're younger, because that's when a lot of your... Uh, connections in your in your brain start to become um, more more permanent if you want to call it that and it's easier for your brain to rewire itself in that case okay now did we talk about this here no okay so that's as far as we got okay We're going to do one more, okay, and then, okay, functions of cerebrum, dying stuff, okay. So, yes, I just want to get down to here, okay. So, again, these higher brain functions that this is referring to, okay, your speech, your emotions, your coordination, and your memory, those are the main four, and... I think on you're on the probably on the back side of the piece of paper that was handed to you. It might on the very bottom start to talk about them functions one of one or one of four, two of four, and three of four. Okay.
Okay, so again, these are your higher functions, speech or language, emotions, okay, coordination, and then, uh, did I say memory? Okay, so then those are your four. Each cerebral hemisphere dominates certain intellectual functions, okay? That's where you get into, oh, I'm a left brain person, I'm a right brain, and not that anyone is more one than the other, but... Some of you are maybe picturing yourself going into more so, we, we, we can fit some possible different types of stereotypes. In other words, we'll just pick on the left side of the room here, okay? In your two cases, we're going to pick on these two ladies, Madison and Amanda, okay? According to that bottom uh, dash there, we'll talk about the diencephalon on at a later time, each cerebral hemisphere dominates certain intellectual functions. So what we've talked about up to this point, Amanda going into the medical field, Madison going into biz business, okay? So when it comes to that of more so abstract thought, just with those stereotypes only, if left brain people are more so into abstract thinking, of those two, which one would fit that stereotype? Which one of those is more so left brain, Amanda or Madison? I would say Amanda and then more so right brain is more so being spontaneous. Do you think you're spontaneous? Are you spontaneous? Spur of the moment, let's go do something different. Maybe? Okay, and again, those are different types of stereotypes. That's where you hear that term left-brained and, and right-brained individuals. Okay, so I've got a piece of paper here I'm going to hand out. It's got uh, um, the vocabulary on here. And on the back side, I thought there, I think there's 13 blanks. I meant for there only to be 12. But when we look at what it says for Tuesday and Wednesday, it's talking about cranial nerves. On page 423, okay, of your book, it's got a table there. It's table 11.9 that has this listed here. It's this table that has all the cranial nerves on here and what function they are. On those blank lines, it's your opportunity to, let's say, practice writing them down in order from front to back, okay? And we'll go over something to help you out here in just a couple moments. All right. There's really no rhyme or reason why there's X's on here at the beginning. So just disregard that it doesn't mean anything. Yep, yep. Yes, I probably should have this on. We all have your um, deals up. Yours is... Well, it's not like it's a walk from one side to the... Well, it is from one side. Oh. oh, all right. Fair enough. Okay. So, one of the things... Do you think, in your opinion, <clears throat> when we talked about chief cells and parietal cells, did little hints like that help you keep those functions separate? Yes or no? Did? Okay. So when you look at that back page, where it says that table on page uh, 423, when it comes to the... Uh, Nerves in order. This is where that long-term memory can, can really help you out. And this was something that was told to myself back in... I was lucky enough to actually have an anatomy class in college and a physiology class. Now, the reason that's more important is when you look at something like this, where it says anatomy and physiology together, we just we're able to spend more time on the anatomy of the human body than the physiology of the human body. Now, is that going to be the same for you individuals? 
Maybe, maybe not. But when you get into a nursing degree program or, well, even that of uh, athletic training perhaps, or maybe some of you w would like to keep on going past uh, a type of undergraduate degree and get into a graduate type school, or maybe even, heck, let's uh, throw this ball as far as it'll go and maybe it'll land in a medical school or something to that effect. Never know. Okay. And with that, again, back in 92, okay, we're talking 28 years ago already, which is kind of sad, but it was explained to me. And I kind of lost track of it a little bit, but some, sometimes, just as long as you don't know enough of it, you can fill in the gaps yourself. Something like on old Olympic tower tips, a Finn viewed a German viewing hippos or something like that. Okay, so that doesn't mean anything to you right now, nor should it, but let's repeat that. On old Olympic tower tips, a Finn viewed a German viewing hippos. Hopefully that's 12. That might be 13. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay. For those of you who actually have page, what would show up best? Probably this one. Page 423 open. What's the first cranial nerve? Something to do with smell. Yep, on table 11.9 on page 423, the first cranial nerve is what? Such the letter O. I guess I didn't, I, didn't, I thought I saw. Someone had it, actually had it open. I gotta make sure I spell it right. Olfactory. Olfactory. That's right. Okay. Then your sight or your optic. Okay. And then this one's oculomotor. Okay, this is trochlear. Now, whether you write those in on that back page now. May you just want to leave that blank and, and so you can practice it because you will be responsible for doing this from front to back. Okay. Actually, ocumulo trochlear trigeminal obducens facial. This one's hard to say. Vestibular. Cochlear. I don't know if that's spelled right. Hopefully it's close. And this is an accessory. This is uh, what glossopharyngeal. And then this is the. I'm missing one, aren't I? Because the vagus is the tenth cranial nerve. I know that. I got them flip flopped around. Okay. This is the G. That's the ninth. Then we go to the Vegas. And then this must be the accessory. And then that's what hypoglossal. Now they're in order. Okay. So whether that may or may not help you, that I really don't know. But as far as we're concerned for today, that's where we're stopping. We'll catch up to you next time.